to America on October 39. Germany permitted people like myself to leave provided uh, you didn't have very much. We arrived in New York with three dollars. My mother had three dollars and I had three dollars. America was a fantasy at that point, uh, which turned out to be a reality. Who were the first ones who did any stock taking of what was emerging unique in literary history abroad? Because if you look at the tradition of literature... I had first really tried to enlist in 1942 in the intelligence service of the Navy. And they told me that they only would take native-born Americans. A couple of months later, I was inducted into the U.S. Army, and after my basic training at Camp Barkley, Texas, I was transferred to the U.S. Military Intelligence Training Center at Camp Ritchie, Maryland. You must remember, I'm driven out of Germany as well. And I came out of the Army in 1945 and enrolled at Columbia in the German department. I was going to be part of this war. Oh, absolutely. I felt rage at what happened to Europe. I felt rage what happened to Jews. Europe was raped by a very powerful, well-disciplined, well-oiled military machine. This is the story of a group of young men in World War II many of them Jewish-German refugees. They escaped the Nazis and found a new home in America. They knew the language and the psychology of the enemy better than anybody else. Fighting fascism was their goal. In Camp Ritchie, Maryland, they prepared for their own kind of war. Four days after Pearl Harbor, Germany declared war on the United States. Among the men drafted into service were many refugees from Europe. In the beginning, they were considered security risks. I was an alien when I was drafted in April of 1941. And then a few months later, and I was by this time a corporal in the army, I became an enemy alien. Being that I was an enemy alien, and they didn't trust me with a weapon. They put me into Camp Grand, Illinois, which is the basic training for the medical corps. Now, I make no aspersions to, to the medics. They're the bravest of the brave. They go under fire without a weapon to help a fallen comrade. But if I was gonna fight a war, I wanted a weapon. I wanted to kill Nazis, not with a syringe. So after my basic training, I was called to my company commander, and I said, sir, private spear reporting, and he said to me, Private Spear, pack your duffel bag, you're shipping out. 
And I said, may I ask where I'm going to? And he told me, confidential information, I can't tell you. I called my wife and I told her I'm going away from Camp Grant. I don't know where I'm headed to. I'll call you when I get there. And the next day I found myself in Camp Ritchie, Maryland, Military Intelligence Training Center. There was a big portal uh, that said uh, something like Military Intelligence Training Center. Now, it struck me even then uh, that that's not the way normally military intelligence advertises itself because, on the contrary, it tries not to declare itself. The Military Intelligence Training Center, MITC, I think that's what we had on the gate. Uh, it didn't say uh, like the beginning of Dante, uh, you know, lose all hope. <laughs> Somebody changed that and made it Military Institute of Total Confusion, MITC. And uh, that in many ways it was. It was the strangest collection of people, but I found a great number of them exceedingly pleasant. Camp Ritchie was founded by the Maryland National Guard. In 1942, the U.S. Army took over and replaced the tents with permanent buildings. The remote location seemed ideal for the task. A school for intelligence and psychological warfare. Somebody in the War Department had realized that enemy aliens might be quite useful in this war. The place was teeming with students from seemingly every European country. Imagine, when I come into the army, I'm 21 years old. A kid. I'm a smart kid, but I'm still a kid. For us, and I think for the Ritchie boys with that European connection, I think it was a, a rebirth. We could shed and we could investigate our past and do something about it and do something about what we didn't like and simultaneously do something for this fantastic country that permitted me to live. We were committed to this war for personal reasons as well as ideological ones. Freedom was at stake, not just in Europe, but worldwide. And we worked harder, both in Camp Ritchie and in the field, than anyone could have driven us. It was self-propelled energy. Guy's parents, his brother and sister. His family could only send one member to the United States, the oldest son. Guy was 15 years old when he came to America in 1937. How are you? <laughs> Pretty damn well. <laughs> Guy and Fred were trained as IPWs, interrogators of prisoners of war. They became a team and stayed together until the end of the war. We sometimes interrogated when it became necessary for 48 hours straight. A spirit of missionary zeal pulsed through that outfit. The German soldiers were scared to death of the Russians. To be in, in Russian oh. captivity. And that's when we started to play with that. Yes. Intellectually play with it. How can we use that? to ever greater advantage. The fear of Russia, the fear of possibly being sent to Russia. And then we came up with the idea that I would dress in a Russian uniform, which we took off uh, Russian liberated prisoners and from some German uh, who had taken them as trophies and stuff. And I, uh, you remember, I. I uh, put myself in a tent with a three-language a, a three kind of caption, Commissar Krukov, liaison officer. With a picture of Joe Stalin in the back, which we had gotten somehow, yes. and Johnny Kersner's road, uh, dedicated to, to my friend Commissar Krukov, Joe exactly. Stalin. Right. Camp Ritchie was an ideal choice. Located in the Blue Ridge Mountains, it was close to Washington, but at the same time well protected against the curiosity of possible German spies. The camp 
was in a somewhat bucolic setting. It reminded me of the Marienbad, Karlsbad area. It had, a, to some extent, a resort quality. Victor, born 1923, spent the first 10 years of his life in Germany. His family had escaped the revolution in Russia. When Hitler came into power, the family moved again to France. French became Victor's language. Around me, in this typically American, almost hillbilly country, uh, I only heard foreign accents and I heard foreign languages. They realized that we were more valuable than the average soldier. Now, mind you, my life is no more important than anybody else's life. But you can teach somebody in six months how to handle a machine gun or throw a hand grenade, but you cannot teach anybody in six months to be fluent in a language in order to interrogate anybody. Compared to the units I had been in before, that was a circus. Uh, but a, a good circus, you know, fun. Uh, there were all kinds of stories. There were rumors at one time that you couldn't get promotion, get a promotion as an enlisted man, say from private first class to corporal, unless you had a German accent. Rudy was born in 1916. He graduated from high school in Leipzig, Germany. In 1938, he came to the United States and joined the army even before America entered the war. Sooner or later, everybody knew each other or was related to somebody that you knew. It became kind of a family thing. This was on a Monday morning, and I had been off over the weekend, and I shake this bed, and this head pops out from under a blanket. And here is Private First Class Joseph Bromberg, who was a childhood friend of mine in Leipzig, and left there many years before I did. And here we meet. And that happened all the time at Ritchie. All over the place, there were little groups of people talking about politics, talking about the latest gossip, talking about Europe. And they talked about philosophy also. I heard very interesting conversations about music and so on. But most of them looked very unmilitary. <laughs> they had slight bellies. And people <laughs> who had no military instincts, basically, uh, who were not fighters, basically, uh, no. Ingenuity and imagination played a great part in their type of war. Germany had not allowed them to stay. Now Ritchie became a haven for some of the most creative minds of this generation. We were intellectuals. And so we, we, we were misfits, really, as far as, far as, as uh, army uh, discipline is concerned. You know. The 14-year-old Sai saw the writing on the wall. Against the will of his parents, he and his brother left Germany as early as 1933 for France. Together, they emigrated to the United States in 1935. I knew I had to uh, fight fascism and uh, Hitler had to be defeated, you know. But uh, in terms of what we, what we think in terms of a tough soldier, I was not tough. I was not tough. I wasn't much of a soldier. I'm basically, I'm an artist. <laughs> I'm an artist. We are delicate creatures. We are, we are very sensitive, you know. Things affect us very easily. There were certain, certain instances during the war uh, when things got very traumatic, you know. Fear had suddenly taken over, whatever else was. When... Uh, Color disappears. There's no color. Uh, the sky, which a minute ago could have been blue, suddenly is just white. You know. 
Blood is not red, but black. Yeah, you lose the sense. I only speak for myself. It may not happen to others. And so maybe that's why, too, in much of my work now, much of my work, which deals with war, uh, it's mostly black and white. Classroom instructions were the most intense instructions I had ever had, either in high school or college. It was a most concentrated course in the most various types of uh, uh, intelligence work, ranging from uh, learning the Morse code to interpreting uh, aerial photography uh, to learning the so-called German order of battle, which were, uh, was a breakdown of all the German divisions we were likely to encounter, and you had to memorize a good part of that order of battle. We were put into the landscape at night. We had to find our way uh, without a compass or with only a compass and no map. I mean, all sorts of exercises, that some of them were quite strenuous. Uh, but on the whole, it was mostly classroom instruction. And yes, and also combat, of close combat, how to kill a person quickly um, by sneaking from behind, you know? So it was physical, it was uh, technical, and it was linguistic. It was often amusing, also. Among the many oddities in Ritchie were a team of U.S. soldiers dressed in German uniforms, sparring partners for the Ritchie boys. Not always did their uniforms fit well. The fake Germans frightened the farmers in Maryland. They thought the invasion had already taken place. But these German tanks were made out of cardboard. German prisoners who had been captured during the African campaign were shipped to Camp Ritchie and they became, so to speak, our guinea pigs. So we went through play acting, but that became quite real and uh, angry at times. <laughs> and then we interrogated each other, you know, and at first we were screaming at each other. <laughs> and then we realized that that's not good enough, that that's sometimes quite stupid. You know, this, uh, the landscape is beginning to look familiar. You oh, come on, you foolish I mean, No. <laughs> <laughs> You could be in Texas. What are you talking about? This isn't Texas. It could be in Texas right now. I, you have no memory whatsoever. Stop it. <laughs> you no, lie. You lie. Look, the, mount, it's the Blue Ridge Mountains are starting in a, in a few minutes. Yeah, but I don't see any yet. Okay. <laughs> in a few minutes. Guy, you're the best. Imagination. He sees already the Blue Mountains. I see nothing. Blue Ridge he sees Mountains. it. Right. <laughs> Germany was at the height of its power when the training in Ritchie began in the summer of 1942. The Ritchie boys had watched Hitler conquer most of Europe. They had feared the invasion of England, but instead Hitler launched his war against the Soviet Union. 1943, the tide was beginning to turn. The Ritchie boys were ready to fight their war. When they left the camp, they were attached to small teams to different units. They were going back to Europe, a homecoming of a different kind. Before I went overseas, I was made an American citizen. Before my, before my time. I, I've always been sarcastic about it. They wanted me to be killed as an American citizen rather than an enemy alien. They wouldn't look good on my record, you know. Hans was born in a small town in southern Germany where his ancestors had lived for hundreds of years. He came to the United States at the age of 19 in 1938. In New York, he married his childhood sweetheart, B, who had fled Germany too. There's no doubt about it that you were thinking that you might get hurt, that you might be captured, special agent CIC, former German citizen of the Jewish faith. Goodbye, Charlie.
I have always had more guts than brains. I was never really afraid. But one of the ironic things is that our dog tags, the official dog tags that these these geniuses in the Pentagon gave us had a J on them for religious preference. Now you can only shake your head when you think back on that. Some of the Ritchie boys changed the letter on their dog tags with very good reason. Werner was born in Berlin in 1920. In 1938, his family fled to Holland. Werner emigrated to the United States with a group of friends. He visited them before he left for Europe. They asked me to show the identification tags and then said, but for religion, you have a P instead of an H. They said, yes, I don't like to be captured by the Germans showing on the identification tags that I'm Jewish, Hebrew. And they said, they got a long lecture of pride and so on and so on. And they said, look, people, I'm going, not you. I despise all wars, but this was different. I, who had come out of Germany and I'd run away the moment Hitler came in, I felt I had to get back and uh, do what I could. The Ritchie boys were going back in American uniforms on June 6, 1944. With an intimate knowledge of the enemy they were facing, they had gone to school with them, played in the same sports teams. They spoke the same language. D-Day, the greatest military operation in history. The Ritchie boys were there, right from the beginning. This is one of three sketchbooks that I took along. Uh, it's the only one that's left over, and, and it was just almost, almost, uh, you know, one ship, one ship right next to the other. There's another GI there at the moment of uh, embarkation. And they had these hedges there in Normandy, you know. And I saw something in the hedge there. And I looked closer. And there was a body, you know, it was a soldier. I nudged him. He was dead. Werner is assigned as an interrogator to an airborne division. On the evening of D-Day, he is on one of the planes. His unit is scheduled to land behind the German lines in the darkness of night. But Werner has never jumped before. I had to get permission from the commanding general to go in without having jumped before. All I wanted to be was with my buddies with whom I had made friends, and be with them, be like them. The moon was out, but there were constantly clouds that were going over the moon, so that you had light on, light off, light on, light off. I found myself at the gate, where we, at the open door, through which we were supposed to go out. And I found out that I was the first person to leave that plane. And I asked why I was the first person. And Zeriga said, because he called me chicken. He said, chicken, because you have never jumped before. If you feel the last minute that you don't want to go, you step a little bit ahead of them and let the rest of the stick go out, you go back to England in that plane. As we are approaching, the area where we were supposed to go down, we uh, were hit very heavily. The next was was shot down. To escape enemy fire, the shocked pilot turns the plane. 
Nobody in the outfit knows that they are being dropped miles away from their original destination. When I got the orders to jump, it's very strange. Nobody jumps. You step out. I didn't have a feeling of falling. The feeling that I had was that the ground was coming up toward you. And I looked down and I saw a white horse running around in what turned out to be a, uh, an apple orchard in Normandy. And the horse was scared. And uh, it was in that apple orchard I landed. My chute got caught up in the apple tree, very, very soft landing. And that was that, and I was by myself. Nobody else in sight. I was terribly squeamish. The moment I got on the beach and I saw dismembered bodies still lying around, I was all of a sudden cured of that squeamishness. I want to show you something. In landing in Normandy, intelligence officers got the map of Holland, Belgium, France, printed on silk. So nothing could happen here. We can do this here to it. Nothing can happen. When interrogations took place on a beach or in a forest or where, wherever we were, you know, we didn't know where. Uh, and uh, we wanted to find out where uh, the particular prisoner we interrogated, where were you? And he would say there and there. I had to have a reference. I mean, it mentioned a town. I never heard, the, never heard the name of the town. I didn't have an idea. And then I saw it, and I could immediately say, were you also in the town nearby? What did you see there? And the interrogation took place. That was the purpose of having these maps. And I saved it. This is 60 years old. Most Ritchie boys operated independently from their units. Sai's task was direct broadcast to the enemy. A dangerous job. Once we got our assignment, we were on our own. My particular job was to uh, use a loudspeaker, which had a certain range of maybe uh, half a mile, and to talk the, uh, the enemy, uh, the German soldiers, into surrendering. On the armored car was mounted the loudspeaker. And we would get into position, and we would, we would send our message. Uh, we had a lot of casualties that way, because all the Germans had to do is just shoot towards the, where the sound came from and would take out the whole, the whole, the whole shebang. Typically, army stupidity, you know, put everything in one package. I was scared shitless, as they would say. I was scared shitless. But the, uh, but once, once we got in place, once we got in place, and I picked up the microphone and I started speaking, I wouldn't say that fear left me, but I became somebody else. Uh, the, the whole horror of war is something which uh, we learned very fast in the f first weeks of being there. Uh, the dead people in the fields, the dead cows, and the smell of death was so terrible that I couldn't eat for days. Philip was born in Vienna in 1918. He emigrated to England in 1936. When the war broke out, he was interned and shipped to Canada. From there, he went to Cuba and finally met his parents again in 1942. He speaks four languages. I became the Jeep driver for an intelligence interrogation team. The only thing was, of course, that it's a practical matter. I knew much more about both interrogation and above all, I knew the language much better, and I knew the German 
army organization much better than my officers. So what happened in the end is that when we went into France, uh, the first lieutenant was driving the, the jeep and I became one of the chief interrogators. Most of the Ritchie boys were trained as IPWs, interrogators of prisoners of war. The teams were very close. Their backgrounds could be quite different, but they were united in their determination. In fact, we all took turns. We either drove or interrogated. We, we were really a group of friends. We had a Hungarian, we had a German, we had an Austrian, we had myself considered French. Then there was a fellow from, a real American from Milwaukee, of German descent, but a real beer-drinking Milwaukee American. <laughs> uh, bring a prisoner up. According to the rules of the Geneva Convention, you're supposed to give only your name and your serial number, nothing else. But that's not how it works. Because, first of all, there are some people who are talkative by nature. And then there are cigarettes that are being offered. And then uh, there are amusing comments made and pretended fraternity. But the Germans too took prisoners. Werner has escaped capture for over one week. Then a French farmer betrays him. On D-Day plus nine, he falls into the hands of the German infantry. While we were being searched, and it was still a little bit daylight, one of the fellows yelled at me, hey, Sergeant, tell them that uh, this is my wedding ring and he wants to take it away from it. I don't want to give away my wedding ring. And I said, please don't reveal to these people that I talk German, because that may cost me my life. Werner, instead of interrogating German POWs, is now interrogated by his German counterpart. This man asked me all sorts of questions. Then he said, but uh, aren't you of German extraction? I said, yes, how do you know? He said, well, you gave me your name, and Werner is obviously a German name. And then he said, where is your hometown? And I said, Lynchburg, Virginia. I didn't want to say New York or Chicago or anything like that. Lynchburg was much more convincing, because most people didn't know those things. He said, Lynchburg, I've been there. And I said, when? I was terrified. And he said, I was there when I was a young man, I think 1926. And I looked at him and he asked him, have you ever been back? He said, no. He said, sir, Lynchburg has changed a great deal since you were there. <laughs> One of the things we were taught at Ritchie is to get him to talk and keep him talking and don't do or say anything that makes them either security conscious or nervous. One of the things I l trained myself to do, learn to do, is not to take notes because that made them nervous. When they saw that they would tell you stuff and then when they saw that you were writing something down, they became security conscious and realized that they weren't really supposed to tell us anything. When the prisoner got a little balky and you said, do you want me to tell you the name of your company commander, your battalion commander, and your regimental commander, and your division commander? And you rattle off a handful of names, which we got from the order of battle. We call that at Ritchie a show of knowledge. The idea being, you might as well tell us, because we will probably know almost everything you're going to tell us anyway. Often, interrogations led to immediate action. The reports were routinely typed up, copied, and passed on to headquarters. The intelligence sections there skimmed the information and put it into the larger picture. To get the necessary information, the Ritchie boys sometimes used gentle persuasion. We had a book that was called the Order of Battle book, the OB book. And the OB book told us exactly what German unit was at what time where. Right. So uh, it was an incredibly valuable document to us. And we could then talk to anybody and say, you're a member of the 43rd Division, 
Well, in 1943, in October, you were in Smolensk, and you fall under an automatic arrest category. We have to turn, turn you, you over to the Russians. And fortunately, we have a Russian liaison officer here, and uh, I, I have no choice since you don't cooperate with me. I could do possibly something for you if you cooperated with me. Uh, but I have to turn you over to Commissar Krupa. Guy, I beg to differ with you. That was implied a little later. Yeah, okay. A little, not that fast, not that fast. First, he met you. Right. Wir haben eine Uniform gemacht, die, ist, die kennt kein Mensch, die gibt es gar nicht. Und dann haben wir die, dann haben wir das voller Medaillen hier, alles voll mit dem. Guy hatte ein Zelt, das war Guy, Guy's Zelt. Und das war ein ziemlich, vielleicht so groß hier wie, wie diese Ecke hier. Da war ein Desk, ein, ein Büro drin. Und da waren aus Holz Stühle gemacht. Aber die Stühle, manche waren sehr tief. Und andere, die genauso aussehen. So, Guy hat in einem, so einem Stuhl gesessen, von hier, und der Gefangene sitzt hier. So, also erstmal etwas deprimierend. Auf dem, auf dem Büro war ein Spiegel. Und Guy hat sich immer in den Spiegel reingeguckt. Und er hatte ein Bajonett auf dem auf dem Spiegel. Das war ganz scharf wie ein Razor. Razor scharf. He loved to do that. He loved to do that with German, with SS, especially when it came to SS. And what he did is he took his bayonet and cut the guy's buttons off on his tonic. He cut the buttons off and the guy, the guy couldn't button his, his jacket up again. And it was very demoralizing. You know, they, they, they got a little scared there. Nach einer halben Stunde of bullshit conversation, I would say, well, General, we have to turn you over to the Russians. Du sollst mal sehen, wie die Farbe sich ändert. Nein, das kann ich nicht. Ich habe nichts gemacht. Ich habe überhaupt nichts damit zu tun. Die SS hat diese, diese furchtbaren Sachen gemacht. Ich habe nichts damit zu tun. Es tut mir furchtbar leid. Aber jeder Offizier über den Rang vom Oberst ist eine automatische, ist eine automatische Arrest Category. Sie, sie fallen unter automatischen Arrest. Und ich muss sie den Russen ausliefern. Kommen Sie bitte mit. Und ich nehme ihn zu Krukov. Then I became Mr. Wonderful. I became Mr. Wonderful American. And I became, and he I became, became that the tough the, son of a bitch, of a that Russian. Russian. I talk pastor. German with a real heavy Russian accent. <laughs> let me hear, let me hear that again. Let me hear it the way you talk. Was warum du sagen das? Du lügen hier. <laughs> <laughs> The Germans were fighting hard in Normandy, but soon they were outnumbered and overpowered by the invasion force. After two weeks, the German unit which captured Werner is captured by the Americans. In an ironic twist, Werner's interrogator now becomes the POW. The Germans were lined up to be taken to prison camps, and one of the kids with whom I had been captured said, now you can tell them that you speak German. And I said, I wouldn't do that to him. He has been unbelievably nice. He has been very pleasant. Why should I now come and tell him that he has been... Uh, cheated. Uh, cheated, more or less. So I went to him and I told him in English. I said, I appreciate it the way you and your bodies have helped us. And I hope that you will be treated as well as you were treated. We shook hands and that was the last time I've seen him. But I did not tell him that I spoke German or that I was an interrogator. I didn't want to do that to him. As the Allied forces were moving towards Paris, the Ritchie boys were earning the reputation of delivering important information fast. I was originally scheduled to train in, as a French interrogator, French interpreter. We did not, of course, interrogate prisons of war. Our basic function was to interrogate close to the front line civilians, peasants, and say, where is the machine gun nest? Where is this? Where is that? 
And that was difficult because the peasant, even with good will, would say, yeah, you go to the uh, left and he shows right. And sometimes, I think, in some cases, did it on purpose because the Americans were not always welcome in Normandy. Even under war conditions, we requisitioned villas, we found ourselves nice rooms in places we ate, we interrogated them about the machine gun nests, but we also interrogated them about perhaps getting some fresh eggs. Uh, I mean, uh, so we had <laughs> certain advantages. I remember we went to a very nice little place on the coast there called Duard de Ney. And uh, as we entered the, the place, there was a very pretty blonde on a bicycle. I stopped her, and she couldn't have been nicer. She was engaged, but she spent the weekend, uh, you know, uh, with the Liberateur. And when I left, she said to me, look, I don't want you to be killed in this war. And she put a, a medal around my neck, which I still have. It was mid-August, 1944. Every GI was dreaming of Paris. But for Victor, going to Paris meant more than for anybody else. The American army had clear instructions not to enter Paris. That was supposed to be the French privilege. So we were waiting, uh, our division was waiting to cross the Seine before we proceeded. But I couldn't resist, I couldn't resist being so close to Paris, my home. And the glory of the liberation of Paris and not be there. So I persuaded a couple of my teammates to take the jeep and drive to Paris. It was total elation for many reasons. A sense of great freedom and power and, and, and maturity. Here was the little schoolboy back uh, with the army in uniform. And of course, I went immediately on a pilgrimage to our house, our home, our street, our uh, playgrounds, the school, etc. But then, of course, I drove right into the heart of the city, and it was so easy to drive, and all of Paris became uh, not only small, but accessible, but uh, became mine. And then we did it again the next day. Of course, there was the enthusiasm and the crowds everywhere offering wine. The speeches one heard or gave, because I got myself into a mood of making speeches to the crowds. I don't know what I said because I had too much wine. People were guessing because they couldn't. I spoke French the way they do, but here I was in an American uniform. Who is this fellow? And it only confirmed me once again in my feeling that I don't really know who I am. Uh, where is my real home? Where is my real family? What is my real country? By that time, of course, I had a new country, which was the United States. By the time we came back on the second day, our division had disappeared. It had crossed the Seine, and then we were in real trouble because officially we were AWOL, absent without official leave bad enough, uh, we could get into serious trouble, of course. And then also the problem of finding our division, where was it? It was running after the Germans who were running themselves, and we were running after our division. It was a rather comic situation. While Paris is being liberated, the training at Ritchie continues. In 1944 alone, 6,747 men go through the different courses at the camp. I feel as though I'm seeing ghosts. You are. I, I have no memory. Zero. Look at this. The 
This is where we studied, this is where we were instructed. Uh, there was one student who was by far the best of us. He had the most retentive memory, it was a private Weinberg. He was the best student under Beale. <laughs> you remember that. 50 yeah. years later, you remember <laughs> yeah. this. I can't believe you. Private Weinberg, unser bester Student. <laughs> if these walls could talk. Yeah. I spent 18 months in what we call combat. Nothing that happened to me came as a surprise after that training in Ritchie. Nothing. Morris Parloff is a rare bird in Ritchie. He is American, learned his German in school, and speaks Yiddish, which is similar to German. With his team, he landed in France three months after D-Day. We were with a special unit called T-Force 12th Army Group. That was an intelligence headquarters group. The basic idea was that where a division was about to go into a large city, we would be attached to that division. We had two jeeps and a trailer. When we were operational, we'd work out of our jeep. And we would have certain lists of things that we were supposed to do, particularly certain offices to go to and look for papers. And people who fall, fell into certain categories would have to be arrested. This was a very high morale group. We were alone. Most of the time, we formed very close alliances. You know, when I speak about Shifter, that's my brother. Richard Shifter was born in Vienna in 1923. His mother and father were denied their visas, so he came to the United States in December 1938, alone. From 1942 onward, I was greatly concerned as to whether I would ever see my parents again. I recall that when I entered the army, we were all being urged to take out life insurance policies for uh, benefit of relatives. And I said, I remember that I don't have any close relatives. On my dog tags, I decided I was going to keep the H. I just must have said to myself, all right, that's the risk I take. We were under fire very often. I think, in my own mind, uh, we were under fire every time we went out. And we would do things that, in retrospect, were not terribly smart, like people rushing down, the soldiers rushing t toward me, say, don't go down there. there. There are Germans down there, and they've been killing us. They, you know, oh, were terrible. And I say, thank you, and we would go. What was that? What, what are you talking about, we'll go? It's an example of the kind of thinking I was indulging in. You know, the fantasy of nobody who's with me ever gets hurt. We got to be in this comic strip next week. And it worked. For some unbelievable reason, it worked. Sai's job has become a little bit safer. The loudspeakers are now separated from the truck with the man on the microphone in a third location. The most successful operations were when we could show them that they were eingekesselt, you know, they were surrounded. But uh, very often we found ourselves, you know, <laughs> we thought we had them eingekesselt, and all of a sudden we found ourselves surrounded again. So you, you, were, you, were, you were in the midst of it, you were in the front. When a shell hits, mortar shell, or a bomb, there's a concussion that takes place. If you get hit by, by the shrapnel for it, you know, well, it kills you or it wounds you. But very often, it just, it just knocks you down, you know. Something that just picks you up and knocks you down. There's these constant concussions. And it's your insides that get 
they get messed up, get inside messed up. So I was all messed up after a while. My inside server, there had been just too many close calls. It would probably save me from, you know, getting a direct hit by either bullets or shadows because I was a little guy, you know. It's more difficult to be hit by uh, the actual bullets, you know, when you're little than when you're tall. There's a couple in the backyard, their own backyard. And I'm asking them for directions. And somebody takes a shot at us. And I'm standing like an idiot. Uh, and so this guard that's with me, he stands. He's to my left. And I'm looking in the woods. I don't see any more fire. I don't hear any more fire. I don't see. One shot. Suddenly, this guy on my left, my guard, fires off a clip right in my left ear. And I say, what the hell was that? I remember, I'll never forget his face. He looks at me like he's dealing with an idiot. Who would they assign them to? And he says, I'm returning enemy fire. And I remember, so help me God, I said this stupid thing. I said, in this outfit, we don't shoot at people. We talk to them. And I began prattling my German that I'd learned at Camp Ritchie of this routine of, the war is over for you. Don't be stupid, enough. And the whole thing about when did you have a last warm meal and the whole business of what are you doing? And to our utter amazement, this guy comes out from behind the tree. And I said, that's the way we do it. We were so lucky, that's all I can say. But the inner demons, you know, that's a different matter. Nobody would have detected anything that, that I wasn't in control. But it was, uh, it was hard. The Ritchie boys continue their mission to get into the enemy's mind to break his morale. It is a war of words in which typewriters become highly effective weapons. Part of the training was to analyze leaflets which already had been used. What was good about it, what was bad about it, how effective would it be. And looking at these leaflets which had been used, I thought most of them were stupid, you know, very ineffective. And I thought a, a kind of a subtle approach is, would be much more effective than any kind of threats. I mean, these were, you know, veteran soldiers, you know, you can't threaten them. So how do you get their attention? And I don't know how it came to me, you know, just put on there a term like I surrender. It was very simple instructions that, you know, when the time comes, this is how you surrender. And then you see, once we had shut these leaflets over, uh, then we would follow up there as a loudspeaker team. <laughs> and I would come and I would say, well, have you learned, uh, have you learned the, uh, what I surrender? It's just the einfach there, surrender. And uh, somehow, it, 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 even if they didn't surrender merely, it lodged in their mind. The most effective leaflet by far was an official looking document that said this is a safe conduct leaflet and on a, if you show that to an American soldier, he is instructed to let you cross American lines unharmed and with good treatment 
and with good food, and it was signed Dwight D. Eisenhower with an official stamp on it. And that one, the Germans kept just in case they were captured. And uh, it sort of says something about the psychological makeup, the official document, which always has appealed uh, to the German personality, I think. This is absolutely amazing. How many Americans? I'd say two. There's six Americans. Yeah. It's a play. It's a mock-up mm -hmm. for, for learning how to interrogate. Mm -hmm. This is a local farmer, and he's seen... What was the obstacle cause? The Germans. I never met look come across. Oh, look. <laughs> what? This is in the sun, the Baltimore sun, what you just said. There's a local farmer who sees us and thinks we're Nazis. Nazis have invaded America. <laughs> it would be very disconcerting, yes. I, would, I, I should say. This is a house, and we were all seated here, and an instructor enters the house, and he does it right, nothing happens. Then he went in again, and he did it wrong, and he would be blown up, perhaps. This whole thing is taking place in a mock village. In the village. It's a fake. Mm -hmm. Radio Luxembourg, the most powerful radio station in Europe, fell into American hands in September 1944. Now the Ritchie boys could send their message directly into Nazi Germany. Truth was the best propaganda. The Germans who listened, despite all threats, were quite often better informed than the American fighting units. I am optimistic about the final victory of democracy. And democracy will win if it only becomes strong. The Ritchie boys were the youngest of those who had fled Europe. There were many others. Einstein had come from Berlin. Novelist Thomas Mann had come from Munich. And then there was Marlene Dietrich. Her mother was still living in Berlin. There she is, lovely Miss Dietrich. Oh, boy. Just see what the boys in the back room will have And tell them I smile And tell them I cry Marlene Dietrich kommt nach Huy in Belgien, zwischen Liège und Amir. Und äh, Guy, Guy und ich, wir sagen, let's, let's go and let's see Marlene. So we took a jeep and we went Und da sind Tausende von, Tausende von jungen Soldaten, die Marlene singt und macht eine Vorstellung, fantastisch. Sie war wirklich sehr, wirklich sehr amerikanisch, sehr, sehr gegen Nazis. Nachdem das vorbei ist, Sag ich, komm, wir gehen, sagen Hallo zu Marlene. Und doch ein bisschen verrückt. Und ich, ich wartete und nach einer halben Stunde vielleicht warten, habe ich gelungen, dass man mich zu ihr bringt. Und ich spreche Deutsch mit ihr und sagte, ich bringe Ihnen viele Grüße von einer Freundin von Ihnen. Sagte, wer ist denn das? Sagte Paula in New York. Fred is not making up a story. He knows Marlene's masseuse rather well. Paula Erickson. Ja, ich bin der Sohn. Oh, das ist aber nett. Und so weiter und so weiter und so weiter. Und da haben wir uns halten. Und da sage ich, haben Sie jemals Deutsche gesehen, deutsche Truppen, mit deutschen Truppen gesehen? Sagt die, nein. Sage ich, wollen Sie mit uns in ein Gefangenlager zurückkommen und ein paar Deutsche mit Deutschen sprechen? Sie sagt, ja. Kommt mit uns in der Jeep. Marlene in der Jeep. Und wir kommen in das Gefangenlager in Hui. Und die werden wild. I mean, das ist, das, das, it spread like wildfire. Kannst du dir vorstellen. Und wir nahmen, wir nahmen sie in die Cage, in die, in die Räume, wo deutsche Offiziere waren. Und die haben natürlich, das war die Hand. Wie, wie sich die Deutschen benahmen, das war fantastisch. 
Das hätte man filmen müssen. It was a special moment when the first Ritchie boys reached the German border. Aachen fell. It was the first German city that fell to Americans on October 21st, 1944. I rounded up my men and I said, let's go on holiday. We'll go to Aachen. It's a big holiday. These were Germans, Austrians, to get back into Germany. By that time, I assumed that my parents had been killed, and I remember on my way into Germany thinking about how I should look at Germans in the world. And I came to the conclusion that uh, to live up to the basic principles that my parents had instilled in me, uh, I would have to view people in terms of individual guilt, that collective guilt is something that I could not possibly subscribe to. You know, being Jewish in that situation is, is different. Uh, it was a good war for me. I mean, I wanted to be in it. I can tell you we did our job well. We collected what we thought were important documents. We arrested the people we thought were important and had good information. And we stayed there for three months. Towards the end of 1944, the Germans had been driven out of France. The war seemed to have come to a standstill, but only for a short moment in time. I thought the war was over. I thought that, well, with the liberation of Paris, since our mission was over, the French campaign was over, I thought, well, now I'm going to stay in Paris. And I even looked for a little uh, flat for myself, and I hoped to find some nice girl uh, and lead a hedonistic uh, uh, existence. I was bitterly disappointed when uh, a few weeks later, they discovered my headquarters, the intelligence headquarters, discovered that I had also had German training in Camp Ritchie. So Camp Ritchie caught up with me, and I was sent to the uh, Hürtgen front. That was not good. That was not good. It was the week before Christmas, 1944. The Ritchie boys were the first to learn about an impending German attack. An intelligence disaster on the American side overshadowed the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge. We had clear information from people who had come across the lines, and we were sent out then to interrogate others. We had clear evidence of massive uh, buildup of troops. We really interrogated maybe 100, 150 people. And almost all of them told us that an enormous assembly of, of German troops was taking place across from us on the German side and that there's going to be a, a massive counterattack. I remember driving late at night to core headquarters and reporting on what we had heard. And to our great chagrin, we were told by the person who received us, we should go home, we should go back and not worry. So basically, we were dismissed. Uh, thank you uh, for coming and go back. And it's that very night we heard tremendous noise, heavy artillery, and we had to make our escape quite quickly. He broke through. And I remember I was in the cellar together with some civilians and some other GIs, and they came down and we threw up our hands and said, uh, basically, Kamerad nicht schießen. I mean, what could you do? I had destroyed all my identification because imagine if they had realized that I was an intelligence guy. All along the road where we were being marched, you know, under guard, there were these women 
Russian women, Polish women, and they were weeping. They must have felt, my God, if some if Americans are being captured, then this wretched war will never end. Hitler was determined to turn the tables one last time. His men were experienced soldiers. Their divisions had fought in Russia. They knew the war in winter. Our division was completely smashed. We were decimated. And so whoever survived, they were all on their own. Little groups were moving, didn't quite know where to move, how to move uh, across the landscape. They didn't know where their units were. They didn't know where the headquarters were. There were no more headquarters. There were no more units. One was living like in a nightmare, trying to grope, trying to find one's way, trying to orient oneself. We were going through almost kind of a lunar landscape. It was ghost-like. I heard and I have reason to believe that it's true. When they, they overran that division and they found the IPW, headquarters and they found one IPW team, six guys, and they summarily shot them in the head. Bang, bang, bang. Right there, on the spot. They s told their commanding officer they were Jews from Berlin. And he reported that and uh, Sepp Dietrich had them shot. Sepp Dietrich was one of the most dreaded SS leaders. His English-speaking units in U.S. uniforms were infiltrating the American lines. Fred realized the danger, especially for the Ritchie boys with their strange accents. Wie ich die vernommen habe, die waren in amerikanischen Uniform. Das war das erste Mal, wie 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 ich in eine sehr sehr kritische, sehr ernste Sache reinkam. We were stopped, and of course, not one of us could speak accent-free English. So we were already suspicious. That then, to test us, they asked us questions that would show whether or not we were real Americans, such as, what's the windy city? And not one of us had an idea, because most of us, even those who had acquired American citizenship, such as I, uh, at that point, we were citizens. I think I, I got my citizenship six months earlier. But I had no idea that Chicago was the windy city. Every American knows that. And then, second question, we were given another chance was, well, uh, what's the, who won the World Series? That is the uh, baseball. Not, we didn't even know what the rules of baseball are. One of the, uh, of the Ritchie people, uh, got killed in uh, friendly fire. What happened was he was in a tent. In the middle of the night, he uh, got up to go to the latrine and was challenged by a sentry, gave the password, but gave it with a German accent. The sentry shot him, killed him. The SS men who were captured wearing American uniforms are sentenced to death. A newsreel crew films the event. At the same time, Radio Luxembourg broadcasts a live account of the execution to its listeners in Germany. A Ritchie boy is the reporter. The soldat wird hereingebracht. Er wird an den Fall gestellt. Hier kommen die amerikanischen Soldaten. Alle sind sehr ernst. Es ist dies das erste Mal dass solch eine Erschießung wegen Spionage durchgeführt wird. Der Oberst gibt jetzt seine Kommandos. Der Gefangene ist durchs Herz getroffen. Er bricht zusammen. as you've been actually in it, in the midst of it, you will never know what war is.
years. For it's one thing which you cannot recreate. It's the smell of war. No movie can recreate it. And there's a smell, there's a stink to war. You know, when bodies explode, you know, all the insides, all, all the shit, you know, flies out too. And it just smells. And together with the gunpowder, there's a terrible stink. Which if people would, 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 would just smell it, you know, they would become pacifists. A few days after Christmas, the German troops advancing in the bulge ran out of ammunition and fuel. The offensive came to a standstill. You know who won the Battle of the Bulge? The brave soldiers? God. One week, we had nothing but heavy snow and low cloud cover. Our fighter planes couldn't come out and protect us. After one week, the skies cleared and our Air Force came out. One morning, I woke I up and I looked in the sky, and not only was the sky blue, but there was about a half a million airplanes flying around up there. The fog had lifted, and the air support came in, and that's what really stopped them. During the Battle of the Bulge, Morris Parloff and his team were cut off in Aachen, in a bubble behind the front. As a student of psychology, Morris used the time and devised the first exhaustive study of Germans under the Nazi regime. We did interviews of everybody in Aachen, 11,599 by the day I left. The people that remained in Aachen remained against the express orders of Himmler. They wanted them all to withdraw. So these were very special people to begin with. Only 5% of them were Nazis, had been Nazis. Of the population of Aachen, which was normally 160,000, less than 10%, 15,000, were still left, had not fled. And we would, from early morning to late at night, interrogate people. This was very strange to us. You know, we had not been trained to interview civilians. And we began to learn about the regulations that people lived under in Germany. And we gathered enough material in our three months there that we wrote a report for which we were all decorated. Uh, later, much later when they had time for that. The investigation became the blueprint for the questionnaire every German had to fill out in the denazification process. In preparing Aachen for peace, however, Morris's team experienced an unexpected clash between political ideals and practical politics. Military government, their job was to make sure that the city got back to functioning and that people were taken care of, and there were hospitals and all the rest of it, and that was a very reasonable thing to do. My view was denazification means for the time being, you will not have any former Nazis in your new government. Military government didn't see it my way, and they began hiring Nazis. The people on the street complained bitterly. What the hell was this? They were, we were putting back Nazis in the government. They were very upset. I got a lot of complaints about this. My men were very upset. They were refugees. They didn't think this was a bit amusing. We're fighting to remove the Nazis. I thought that was outrageous. The war was still going on, you understand. This was the first city. As the war was moving into the German heartland, every Ritchie boy of Jewish heritage was alone in dealing with this fundamental dilemma. The Ritchie boys were coming home to the land of their forefathers, but their house was empty. Because the Rhine, it was the Jewish holiday of Passover, when the ancient Hebrews were freed from slavery in Egypt. 
Here I'm born in Germany, being kicked out at the risk of my life. If I'd have been there another few months, I would have been in the concentration camps, like my brother and like six million others. And here I am again on German soil as an American soldier. I mean, you can imagine the feelings. Very sentimental, very sad that I had to come back, fight against the country in which my forefathers were born 500 years before me. I got a bottle of wine from our chaplain and we sang the old songs that refer to the biblical exodus from Egypt of 2,000 years ago. In the three months since his capture, Philip had continued his intelligence work in the German POW camp under quite different conditions. Some of our people were so starved that they really literally had great trouble getting out of bed because they were so weak already. I mean, I had lost 60 pounds and I was one of the strongest guys there. I thought the most important thing I could do was to keep up the morales of my, morale of my fellow prisoners by giving them the best information I could. I mean, like a real intelligence man, you see. They broadcast German information all over the camp. Now, of course, if they said uh, uh, stuff like uh, uh, <clears throat> Frankfurt is being victoriously defended, my reaction was it's about to fall, you see. Then at night, I used to slip into the various American barracks and uh, give, give them information and give them lectures on, on the situation. The American front was coming closer. Philip feared a bloodbath on the day of liberation. I went to see the German commandant, and I said to him, Sir, I said, the first thing is, host the Red Cross flag over this camp. And then I said to the commandant, look, when the American tanks are near, give instructions that I can go over the barbed wire without being shot by the guards. The next day I saw these big tanks in the distance. And I climbed over the barbed wire, taking a chance. Then with my last strength, I ran towards the tanks. And as I did so, um, a jeep appeared with two people in it, uh, first lieutenant, second lieutenant. And the first lieutenant said to me, Phil, for heaven's sake, what are you doing here? And I said, I always go for walks in Germany in the morning, uh, you know. And uh, he was a wonderful guy who had been in Camp Ritchie with me. Stalag 9A was liberated at the end of March, 1945. For them, the war was over. A few days later, Sai arrived at Buchenwald. We had gone through several uh, Arbeitslager work camps. So I had some notion about, about the concentration camps. But when we got to Buchenwald, that was just two days or so after its liberation. I came a little bit too late. Would have been interesting to be in that. I uh, thought, would I recognize any of them? Would I know any of them? But even if there would have been anybody I might have known, I wouldn't have recognized them. Because uh, most of them were almost unrecognizable as human beings. Right after that, I, I checked in the nearest medical center. And I realized I was finished. I couldn't go on, I was finished as a soldier. The Ritchie boys continued their work, interrogation. What they saw and heard had not been in their textbooks. 
Hungarian schoolboys became POWs. Haben Sie gegen amerikanische Truppen schon gekämpft? Was? Haben Sie gegen Amerikaner gekämpft? 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 Ja, gegen Amerikaner. Haben Sie geschossen gegen Amerikaner? Geschossen? So. Nix, wir nix schossen. Oh, they says they never fired a shot. Never fired a shot. That's old, uh, What's the age of this boy? Too alt sind sie. Zwölf. Twelve years old. Tens of thousands of German soldiers were now surrendering. There should have been prisoners of war, but the war was over. We didn't want to watch over them, we didn't want to feed them, we didn't want to house them. We called them disarmed German forces, not prisoners of war. You understand? Go home, plant potatoes, make babies, leave us alone. Germany capitulated on May 8th, 1945. A few days later, a guy and a buddy went to Hildesheim, his hometown. Als ich die, in die Stadt reinfuhr, Stadt war äh, in den letzten Kriegsmonaten noch ungeheuer zerstört worden, äh, da kriegte ich wirklich, also äh, ich war äh, so aufgeregt, dass der Billy sagte, du, äh, ich war am Steuer, der, der Billy sagte, weg vom Steuer, ich fahre jetzt. Du bist äh, viel zu sehr ergriffen und das war wirklich ein... Äh, wie soll ich es ausdrücken, ein mir nahegehender Moment. Ich kannte jede Straße in Hildesheim. Ich war äh, emotionell verknüpft mit der Stadt. Dieses Wiedersehen und die Kindheitserlebnisse und die Jugenderlebnisse, das lebte alles wieder in mir auf. Das machte mich bestürzt, dass ich auf diese Art und Weise wieder Hildesheim betrete. His family was no longer there. They perished in the Warsaw Ghetto. Morris's team went to Nordhausen, where the V1 and V2 rockets were assembled. They had to secure as much information as possible about the secret arms program before the camp was turned over to the Soviets. Slave laborers had built Hitler's vengeance weapons. It was a concentration camp in the worst sense of the word. And they showed me around. And I remember they had these ovens and one guy got up on a pile of ashes. He climbed up, it must have been six feet at least, and he announced from up there, I am standing on a pile of Jewish ashes. And I shouted at him to get off, just get off. And I wouldn't get off. He was looking at me like, what, what? This is what, this is our life. And I pulled him off. And something very funny happened, funny, strange. I realized I could not identify with these people. I knew they said they were Jewish. I was Jewish. But these were not people that I knew. When I got up on the podium to talk to these people, I began talking, and I began talking in German. And I stopped. I said, no, I'm not going to talk in German. I'm going to talk Yiddish. And to my utter astonishment, I had completely forgotten. I couldn't speak a word of Yiddish. I didn't remember. I, <clears throat> I, 
blanked it out. I just was no longer Jewish. Not like that. I made a recommendation to the War Department to dig a big hole at the Elbe to the Rhine, dig a big hole and plow it over and forget about Germany. I know this sounds horrible, but that's the way I felt. But this could not interfere with my duty. I'm humbly proud that because of my training and simply by the misfortune of having been born in Germany that I was saving many American lives. And I never fired one shot in anger in all of World War II. That was not my job. I was protecting the people who were shooting. That was my job. The old Ritchie barracks, with all their memories, will soon be gone. But the Ritchie boys are still around to tell their story. Ritchie was very important to the Ritchie boys. It gave us a sense of a meaningful activity that in one way or another connected with our real personal life and experience. The teams were bright, available, not always courageous, not always expert warriors by a long shot, but they were certainly their heart was in it. When I came back from, from the war itself, I was just uh, disgusted, just absolutely disgusted with everything. In the beginning, I really, I, I, yeah, I couldn't shake hands with Germans. I, the question always was, where were you during the war and all this? You know, I really wasn't, wasn't, uh, I, I always would have, would have wished that, you know, they would have killed them all, you know? It's just my, my growing rationalization that somehow, yeah, I saved German lives too. I, I saved lives, you know, and, uh, and I, feel, I feel good about it. I just gave birth. Yeah, that's what it is. You give birth. Just like like labor pains, you know. C'est ça, the French say. Das is it. I think this friendship was very sustaining. These friendships were very, very wonderful during that time. But we were all basket cases. Think of it. I was four years in this country. So what super American can I be or be, have become? And then their dreams. What am I going to do with my life now afterwards? So all of this, it, 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 it was for me an incredible immigration. I mean, it was my immigration. It wasn't just landing here in October 39. It, it lasted from October 39 to the end of 1945, really. Could you do the interview without your glasses? Without my glasses? Yeah. 
Right, this, well, I'm, I can see you, but uh, I'm better looking with the glasses. We concocted the story that we had captured Hitler's latrine orderly and uh, that he had a very uh, significant information about the genitals of the Fuhrer. Of the Fuhrer. And uh, his <laughs> a, uh, Only in the American army. Uh, and uh, that, that he had a shrunken scrotum and stuff like that. So we wrote that story and we get, turned it into Kevin Kahn and he laughed and he said, oh, we'll put it uh, as an appendix to, to our, special friends. To special friends. And it went up to headquarters and everybody laughed their head off. And they thought it was a great story. One forwarded it to Washington, D.C. And we were visited within seven days by some colonel or somebody who wants to interview this guy. And then you had to... Oh, we had trouble on that. We both had trouble on that. About seven years ago, I was writing an article about our adventures in, in Army intelligence. And Judy comes home and she sees me rolling in laughter on the floor. In this book published in Britain, there is a story in there, the most, uh, one of the most exciting cases that CIC faced was the case of Private Joachim Stahler, who was a latrine orderly to Hitler. So two serious scholars had gone into the National Archives, still found I this know, I never, that's No, I wrote about it.